In addition to diabetes, carbohydrates are implicated in a number of other conditions, and that's what we're going to discuss now. So one thing, kind of the opposite side of diabetes, chronically high blood glucose levels, is the opposite, which is chronically low levels of glucose in the blood, hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia, we've all experienced it before. Uh, symptoms include dizziness, extreme hunger, headache, irritability, tiredness, and mental confusion. We sometimes, uh, there's a certain type of hypoglycemia that we sometimes call the symptoms being hangry. You know, when you haven't eaten in a while, and that could be fasting, hypoglycemia, your blood sugar is really low and you feel tired and irritable and like you don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> So that's one way that hypoglycemia can occur. It can also occur both in diabetes and not in diabetes due to excessively high insulin release. When too much insulin is released um, or we inject too much insulin into our body, that can significantly drop blood glucose to this state where it leads to the symptoms of hypoglycemia. Non-reactive hypoglycemia means kind of every other reason why hypoglycemia can occur that doesn't have to do with insulin. So like I said, people that are fasting might experience hypoglycemia, certain medications, pregnancy can cause it, and a number of disorders can cause it as well. So if there doesn't seem to be another cause of it, like it's not from fasting and not from excessively high uh, insulin dose, it is something to, worth talking to a medical professional about to figure out if there's an underlying cause that's leading to it. A lot of people are very concerned about sugar in their diet these days. And yes, too much sugar in the diet, especially added sugar, can be negative for health especially if it comes from a diet that's really high in processed food, which is how we typically get a lot of our added sugars in. Extrinsic sugar, or the sugar that's found added into foods, is no different chemically than intrinsic sugar, that sugar found in a fruit or a vegetable, for instance. However, foods that contain a lot of extrinsic slash added sugars, these tend to be very nutrient poor and energy dense. They tend to be really low in fiber and just really high in sugar as well, promoting a like a boom <laughs> of a glycemic response. And in general, we're not saying to avoid sugars, but you know, one of the main concepts of this course is to minimize the consumption of processed foods. And by doing that, you'll get less of these extrinsic sugars, plus you're going to get more fiber in your diet as well, which helps to regulate our glycemic response too. When we talk about sugars in health, we often talk about sugar-sweetened beverages. And there has been a large body of research that has shown that diets that are high in these sugar-sweetened beverages increase the risk of obesity and cardiovascular disease. And that's why the Food Guide recommends replacing these sugary beverages with just water. One sugar-sweetened beverage every once in a while isn't going to kill you, isn't going to cause cardiovascular disease. But when sh extrinsic sugar and processed foods and sugar-sweetened beverages are primary part of your diet, then we're at risk of not getting the nutrients our body needs, promoting a really high glycemic response, and increasing the risk that ultra-processed foods bring into the diet, in particular in increasing the risk of obesity and cardiovascular disease. So because so many people are worried about sugars these days, a lot of people opt for non-nutritive sweeteners or artificial sweeteners as they're known. These are interesting because they're, they're not sugar, but they taste like sugar and it's, they kind of bind to sugar receptors leading to the perception of a sugary taste in the brain. And in general, only, you only need like a little, little, little amount of these artificial sweeteners because depending on the sweetener, they're about 30 to 1300 times sweeter than sugar. Now, it stands to reason that if you are trying to lose weight and you currently eat a lot of sugar, which has calories in it, if you were to switch from something that has a lot of calories in it to something that doesn't have calories in it, non-nutritive sweeteners, that that would promote weight loss. However, that is not exactly what the evidence shows. 
there's evidence to suggest that individuals and animals that eat more of these non-nutritive sweeteners actually are the same weight or actually higher in weight than those that, that don't eat these artificial sweeteners. There isn't black and white consensus that these non-nutritive sweeteners reduce BMI, reduce body mass index, reduce weight, and in fact, there's more evidence to suggest that they actually increase the likelihood for someone to be obese. Is that because individuals with obesity are more likely to use non-nutritive sweeteners? That part's not clear. What we would suggest as a take-home message, however, is to just reduce the amount of processed foods and reduce the amount of sweeteners from all sources and just stick to whole foods and the types of sugars that are found in those. You know, back in the 90s, it was fat makes you fat, eating fat makes you fat, and now it seems that a lot of people are worried that by eating carbohydrates, they're going to gain weight. And that is just an oversimplification of how energy balance works. The only thing that we know for sure promotes weight gain is consuming energy in surplus to your energy needs, consuming more energy than you burn. That's the only thing that we unequivocally know leads to weight gain. So yes, if you're eating carbohydrates in a way that overall your energy intake far surpasses your energy expenditure, yeah, you're going to gain weight. But you could say the same thing about lipids and you could say the same thing about proteins. However, one of the issues with carbohydrates and especially diets high in processed carbohydrates is they tend to be really high in sugar and really low in fiber. And this kind of combination might reduce our chances of feeling full. <laughs> when I eat sugar, it makes me want to eat more sugar. <laughs> and a lot of people are like this. You know, it's sugar is less likely to put the brakes on our appetite. Okay, and that's why we recommend eating whole foods and whole sources of carbohydrates, which are more likely to promote that feeling of fullness. Conversely to sugar, other types of carbohydrates, in particular fiber, like study after study, has shown an, a negative association between fiber consumption and weight. The more fiber people eat, the more likely they are to have a lower weight. And part of the reason is that fiber is filling. It adds bulk to your stomach, making you feel more full when you've eaten. So again, getting back to that take-home message that keeps coming up week after week is if you eat more whole foods, whole foods that yes, can have carbohydrates in them, but if you eat more whole foods, you're probably going to get the nutrients in a form, in a mixture that's more likely to promote health and reduce the risk of disease. One thing that is really well known about carbohydrates and risk of carbohydrates is that they increase the risk of developing dental caries. And you might know the word dental caries, or you might know the word dental cavities. And we've all had cavities or holes in our teeth before. One of the things that promotes the development of these holes is when acid wears away at the enamel of your teeth, causing a hole to occur in your teeth. Now, where is acid coming from? Yes, some foods we eat are, are acidic, but a lot of this acid actually is secreted by bacteria that act on the sugars we eat. So when we eat a lot of sugary foods, especially again, refined sources of carbohydrates, high in extrinsic sugars, when we eat these, the bacteria in our mouth eat up those sugars, ferment those sugars, and in the process, they release a type of acid. This acid wears away at our teeth enamel. And that's why your dentist tells you to eat less sugar as part of healthy to tooth management. The more kind of sugary foods, processed sugary foods you eat, and the more likely foods are to kind of stick to your teeth, the more likely they are to prom promote the bacterial action that leads to the secretion of acid, which breaks down the enamel of our teeth. Again, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, same thing as with obesity and cancer, that it really depends on the carbohydrates you take in. Diets, again, that are high in extrinsic sugar, refined carbohydrates, basically processed and ultra-processed forms of carbohydrates, these are associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And conversely, as the story keeps going, diets that are high in fiber are associated with a lower cardiovascular disease risk. And that is because soluble fiber in particular 
has a twofold healthy effect on our cardiovascular system. Number one, soluble fiber helps reduce that bad cholesterol that we'll learn more about in the next unit. Okay, this bad cholesterol is the one that can deposit in the arteries, like in our heart or in our brain, and promote what we call a heart attack or a stroke. So lowering LDL is a good thing. Soluble fiber also helps to regulate blood sugar. Okay, and blood sugar and unregulated blood sugar, especially when it gets into that hyperglycemia level, that can increase the risk of diabetes. And diabetes, as we know, is one of the main risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Okay, so eating a diet, again, high in whole foods, low in refined carbohydrates, high in fiber, this is the kind of diet that's going to reduce your risk of obesity, reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, and reduce your risk of colon cancer as well. One last thing to talk about when it comes to carbohydrates is that some people have a hard time digesting carbohydrates, especially the indigestible fiber-rich ones. And as we learned about in chapter three, one of the negative things that can occur in our digestive tract is something called irritable bowel syndrome. And individuals that experience this condition, they're more likely to have a lot of discomfort, abdominal discomfort, bloating, increased flatulence, having to go to the washroom often in a day. It can be quite uncomfortable. And one of the things that may aggravate the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome are some things called short chain carbohydrates, those which are not fully absorbed in the small intestine and then move on to the large intestine where bacteria act on them. Okay, eating foods that are lower in these short chain carbohydrates, which are collectively known as food maps. Okay, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Uh, by reducing these types of food, it can potentially help improve IBS symptoms. So in this uh, chart right here, I have some examples of some high food map foods. And again, if you or someone you know has experienced IBS, minimizing the consumption of these types of foods that you'll notice are mostly carb dense, especially fiber dense, the, this can potentially help to uh, ameliorate some of the symptoms of IBS. But quite honestly, every case is different. And really, it sometimes takes a lot of trial and error to find what kind of things are going to minimize symptoms and help that person feel the most comfortable. So the take home message from this carbohydrates and health and disease section is to eat a lot of whole foods to consume less of the highly processed carbohydrates, and that's what's going to help you reduce your risk of disease while promoting overall health.